Good evening and welcome to our English-speaking congregation. We welcome you to a new series in Crossroads, namely Reflecting Jesus. And firstly, we would like to say thank you for your messages that you send in from so many different people from across South Africa and across the world. And it remains our privilege in Jatniel as a team to be able to speak to you um, from the Word of God and to encourage you during this time of lockdown. But it is not God's will for us to be spiritually locked, locked down. It is His will and purpose that we should be free in the Spirit and that we should know the truth because it is the truth that sets us free. So let us bow our heads and we pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we approach your throne of grace this evening in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And, and Father, it is it remains such a privilege just to come to you and to have access to the throne of grace. And your word says that we should come boldly to the throne of grace, that we can receive mercy and obtain grace to help in a time of need. And Lord, we would like to share your word this evening, but we are so dependent upon the anointing of your Holy Spirit. And therefore, Father, we ask you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ that the anointing of your Holy Spirit will please rest upon the words that I'm about to speak. And then also those who will be receiving or hearing these words, that your presence will be there as well and that you will prepare the hearts so that the seed can be sown and that there can be fruit. Lord, we, we want to pray for our congregation members that are suffering and under this difficult circumstances. Father, God, thank you for the means that we have through this technical equipment to reach them and to encourage them. And we pray your godly blessing upon us in the name of Christ Jesus, the Messiah. Amen. Now, yesterday evening, uh, Brother Paul, Paulus Special started his new series with the heading Reflecting Jesus. And his topic was love the essence of Christian character. And I would just like to repeat certain principles that he mentioned. The one that stood out to me was what he said, that the purpose of Christian growth is to develop a Christian character. And on the other hand, the purpose of developing a Christian character is to become more like the Lord Jesus. And, and, and dear ones, this is a process. This does not happen overnight. And I would like to show you the slide, the overview. There we see that what Paulus spoke about was love, the essence of a Christian character. And what I'm going to speak to you tonight is about love explained as agape actions. And then, as from next week, we will talk about love experienced as peace and joy. And then the evening after that, it will be love expressed in a right relationship. And then love empowers to resist temptation, where we are empowered through the Holy Spirit by the love of God. Now, the topic of tonight's presentation is called Defining Love. And I have to be honest with you, when, when you do make a presentation like this and about love and about God's love, and you read the Word to find out what the Word of God says about love, then you realize your own inadequacy to make such a presentation and to speak about such a um, such an important topic as the love of God. So right from the beginning, I would like to 
um, to, to state that we are in this together and together we are going to learn about the love of God and what the Word of God says about this topic. Now, love is the nucleus. Love is defined as the choice fruit of the Spirit that encompasses all the others. And one could say that the first fruit of the Spirit is love. And that the other fruit mentioned, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control are all expressions of love. For example, when somebody is kind-hearted or faithful, it's an expression of love. When somebody is gentle, it's an expression of God's love towards us. And love is the core quality and defining characteristic of Christian character. For God himself is our model and God is love. It's the essence of God, the being of God. And love is at the center of Christian ethics. Or as someone stated, love is the supreme ethic because All the commandments of God are summed up in the commandments to love God and our neighbor. Now, in the, um, I'd like to, the instruction, what is love? Um, We can say the word is in such a common use to describe such a diverse range of actions and emotions that it is essentially to, to define exactly what love is. And we're going to show you a slide and then you will see how the words I love you is expressed. If you can think of two teenagers making it out and the boy says to the girl, I love you. It it, it is a superficial type of love. But the next one, a mother to her drug addicted son to say, I love you, my son. Or an insecure person in the mirror and that he was told you should go and stand in front of the mirror and tell him, I, I, I love myself. And then again, a man to his dying wife of 50 years to tell her, I love you. It comes from deep within. The superficial one again, the coach to, to a star player after winning a big game saying, thank you, I love you. And then the drunkard to his brandy bottle to say I love you under the influence of alcohol. In the New Testament we have three words that are translated that translated love into English and the first one is the word eros and I mentioned this to the um, when we did the Afrikaans I mentioned this that I usually to memorize something or to remember, I make an association. But the association that you should not make here with Eros is Oros. Oros, the, the orange cold drink, or Eros, the, the, the currency used in, in Europe. Eros, but Eros is also a place in Namibia. So Eros is a, to explain it, it's a physical love that results from sexual desire and is appropriate only between a husband and a wife within the context of marriage. It is a true expression of love for another person, but in other contexts, it degenerates into a selfish lust. So eros is based on need, what the other person can do for me. Then we get filial love. Filial love is a human love such as the love that exists between friends. The natural fondness and kindness between friends is the dominant character of filia. It is also described as conditional love. This is an essential quality of human love, but it falls short of the kind of love that God desires for his people to have. And philia is based on mutuality, what we can do for each other. Agape love, agape love is divine love, that which is based on the nature of God himself. 
and God's love, it is so amazing when you start doing this Bible study and start analyzing it and you see the love of God. It is absolutely wonderful. God's love is selfless, placing the well-being of the other person above personal well-being. That is, that's divine. Agape is more than a wave of emotion. Um, it is a decision of the will to always act in another person's best interest. This We can only describe this as, as godly because we don't have the means to do that. Um, as the man in his sinful state is incapable of agape love, agape is only possible through the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And again, I want to repeat it. This is a process that takes place when we cooperate with the Holy Spirit in our lives. Then there will be spiritual growth. And this is so important. This word is so important. Agape in the New Testament, it is so commonly used. And in, in, it's not in the New Testament occurring 259 times. That is now the noun and the verb. Then I'd like to show you another slide. And the table below summarizes the characteristics of the three different words. What is love? Eros, it's the sexual love. Philia, it's the natural love. Agape, it's absolutely divine love. Eros, is between lovers, philia between friends, agape, God to man. Eros, based on needs, my needs. Philia, based on likes. Agape, based on values. Eros, what can you do for me? Philia, what can we do for each other? And then agape, what can I do for you? Then the last one, I love me and I use you. I love, And then philia is I love you and you love me. And then agape, I love you and I serve you. And this is so beautifully portrayed where Jesus, just before his crucifixion, was with his disciples. He talked with them and he said, what I'm about to do, I set as an example. And he bowed down and he washed their feet, being a servant, godly love. Agape is almost that we do not have words to, to explain what it really means. So, the definition that we found of agape, we will show you on the next slide. What is love? Agape is defined, agape is the spirit which says, no matter what any man does to me, I will never seek to harm him. This is godly. I will always seek nothing but his highest good. Agape is a deliberate principle of the mind and a deliberate conquest of the will, not simply a wave of emotion. Then I'd like to show you another slide, and that is, who must I love? On the next slide, it says, if we have a look at it, love for God, love for self, Love for others. And we go over to the direction of love. And the direction of love, we must express agape in three dimensions. And namely, the first one is upwards towards God. The second one is outwards. And the third one is inwards. I'd like to read from Matthew. From Matthew Chapter 22 from verses 37 to 40. Matthew 22, 37 to 40. Jesus replied, 
Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and prophets hang on these two commandments. Now, I'd like to take or make an example of this. Some Christian pastor who passed away, I think in 2016, made this beautiful example, and I found it the other evening. And he explained our Christian walk. He said the majority of Christians are like a person who's driving a car. And that car's got a, um, a speedo cruise button. And when you engage the speedo cruise, the car automatically takes the speed that you set it on at 120 kilometers an hour. And then basically you just sit there and you, you drive the car. And he uses the example that you flow with the traffic next to you. With the Christian culture, you just flow. And you do it very easily the way that you want to do it. And then he used the example of a racing driver. And quite by coincidence, on News 24 this week, there was a clip of a French racing driver, and I looked at it, driving on Nürburgring, that's in Germany, and one of the most difficult tracks to, to drive. And they showed this person, and they had the camera fitted inside the car, and the rev counter, it was a Porsche, and the rev counter was running between eight and 9,000 revs per minute the whole time. He was driving that car at about 300 plus kilometers around that track, and he had, you should see how he is concentrating. He is driving with his whole heart. He's driving with his whole soul. He's driving with all his mind and all his strength. He is holding on to that wheel and he, at that pace, carrying on. Now, if you look at the words that the Lord Jesus said, then you can see your whole heart, your whole soul, your whole mind, and Luke adds all your strength. It's intense. It is not half-heartedly. It, it's God wants, he needs our mind so that we can serve him with everything that we have. Now, if we look at the love for God upwards towards him. That's the greatest duty and privilege for us to love God. And we must love him wholeheartedly with every fiber of our being. The outward is the, the love for man. Loving God includes everything he loves. And he loves everybody. He loves mankind more than anything else. And this compels us to, to love and therefore, anyone who loves God must also love his fellow man. First John chapter 4. Loving our fellow man with agape love is only possible if we have a relationship with Jesus Christ. And then, again I mention it, and then it's a process that takes place. It doesn't happen overnight. And through our relationship with Christ, the love of God is poured out into our hearts by the Holy Spirit. You should go and read Romans chapter 5, the first eight verses of Romans 5 verses, where it says that the love of God has been poured out in our hearts through the Holy Spirit. In other words, it's, it's, it's there. And the Holy Spirit, through this process that we are in, if we cooperate with him, he works it out. He works it out. He works in us to work it out so that we can move into agape love. Now, for inward, the love for self, since God loves you, 
you must love yourself. Now, we are inclined to think of, well, that's totally wrong. But the Bible says if God loves you and he loves everybody, then we have to love ourselves, but not in the wrong way. Now, everyone instinctively does what is best for himself in terms of meeting his felt needs, such as the need for food and clothing. However, biblical self love goes much beyond things to care for our spiritual and emotional needs, especially for our needs to cultivate a personal relationship with God. We should not love ourselves in the sense of being full of ourselves, but in the sense of doing what God says is best for us. Then we have a look at love demonstrated. Now through scripture, scripture abounds with acts of love, but none compares to the act of God in sending his son to die for our sins. The Bible itself holds this up as the yardstick by which all other acts of love are to be measured. If we think of John 3 verse 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but will have everlasting life. And then, God did not love us because of who we are, but in spite of who we are. He d- the love of God is so wonderful. He does not love us because of what we are like, but because what he is like. His love was a selfish concern for our well-being that motivated him to do what was best for us, even though it was not best for him. In Romans chapter 5, verse 8, it says that God demonstrated his own love for us in this while we were still sinners christ died for us that's how god demonstrated this agape this godly love for you and for me now god not only loved us he loved us extravagantly he did not hold back in expressing his love for us right up to the end And the next two points is is so important. And even though we rejected his love as humans and we crucified, we murdered his son, he continued to pursue us with passionate devotion, even going so far as to include us in his family. A few years ago, I, I read something It was an example to explain this, but it was about a family who had, a, I think, a mother, a father, and two or three children, and the oldest child was a son. And this son was murdered, and eventually they caught the person, and he was sentenced to life imprisonment. Now, life imprisonment in South Africa is 15 years, and... When the person was released, the father, this will be equal to what, to explain God's love, the father would go to the authorities to say, I believe this person has been released, he's served his term, but apparently he doesn't have any place to go. Imagine doing this. We, I, want to take him in, We will accommodate him and we will make him a member of our family. That is, that's what God did for us. We murdered his son. He came back for us. He brought us out of the miry clay and he said, come in. I want to make you my son and my daughter. And that is what John 3 verse 1 says when it says, how great is the love of The Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. I'd like to show you another slide, and that's called, How Do I Love God? The question, 
What does the Bible consider as the main expression of our love for God? And the answer is obeying his commandments. In John 14 verses 15, 23 and 24, if you love me, you will obey what I command. If anyone loves me, he will obey my teachings, and he who does not love me will not obey my teachings. Who loves God more? These are two questions. The first one, Mary spends two hours in prayer each day. She is bold and witnesses to all her friends. On the other hand, Sipo has com compiled a list of all the commandments and laws of God. He has now memorized them and is rigorously disciplined in applying them each day. We have love for God, then we have love for self, and then we have love for others. How are we to show the love? God has demonstrated agape love to us, but how are we to show love? We have seen we must show love to God, to others, and to ourselves. Let's take a few minutes to ask how we should express love in each direction. The love for God. Jesus said the primary expression of love for God is obedience to God, to his commandments. I've read the scripture. However, we should be careful not to confuse obedience with legalism. And the response Jesus seeks is to be enthusiastic, willing, joyful, obedience out of a heart overflowing with love and gratitude for him. The kind of obedience that the Pharisees had was not real love for God. And I would like to, just for a few moments, have a, a look at the example of Saul before he became Paul. Saul was had an in, Saul had an intense um, interest and love for the knowledge of God, but not for God. And the result was zeal, a zeal. This knowledge became a zeal for God. But this zeal did not produce love. It did not produce um, tolerance or a compassionate with other people. Instead, it brought a feeling of, I am better. I know the word. And knowledge, the Bible says, knowledge puffs up. I am big. I, I know this is wrong, the way that they say it, the way that they teach that, it's not right. But on the other hand, love bears with us and it, it carries other people. And knowledge without love, you can, you see it. Knowledge without love criticizes and you find fault. Slide number eight. How do I love others? Now, we will be studying this topic in detail in Lesson 4 when we talk about love expressed. And these four fruits related specifically to love for others are patience, kindness, goodness, and faithfulness. Love for others, um, as I mentioned, this, it, it will be um, covered <clears throat> next week. Then we have a look at the next slide. How must I love myself? Now, self-love can have good and bad meanings. The Bible teaches us to love ourselves and not to love ourselves. On the one hand, to love ourselves and then not to love ourselves. In what sense is self-love bad? In what sense must we not love ourselves? In what sense is self-love good? And in what sense must we love ourselves? Now keep the definition of agape love in mind. Now this one is, is more controversial. Self-love can be good 
or bad. There is a form of self-love that leads to being proud, greed, lack of self-control, etc. The first item in Paul's prophetic list of the sins that will be characteristic, characterize people in the end times um, will be lovers of themselves. And I'd like to read this to you from 2 Timothy chapter 3. This is a few verses there. He says in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1, he says, But mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, and then lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Now remember, Paul is speaking to Christians. He's not speaking to the heathen and the unbelievers. And he's telling us prophetic words that in the last days where we live in currently, that is what the characteristics of people will be, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. How true this is. Then it says, having a form of godliness, Christians, but denying the power of God, having nothing to, to do to this people like that. We shouldn't associate with people like that. Now, Paul mentions lovers of themselves first in this section that I read. Why, why did he do that? Why does he mention it first? Because the love of self is the root for the 18 mentioned characteristics follow, following the love of self. The, the love for self um, starts all of the others. It edges it on and it grows from self-love. And therefore, the Lord Jesus said, if you want to be my disciple, you have to deny yourself. Now, we see this in our life every day. Men and women are obsessed with self-love, obsessed with their bodies. Books about self-help and self-image fill the shelves in bookstores, even Christian bookstores. And yet... There is a kind of self-love that is biblical, and that is doing what God says is best for you and for me. To treat yourself with agape is to do what is best for you, even if you don't, if we don't feel like it. For example, self-love requires that you submit to Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior, because ultimately that is the best for you. It means that we should nurture our relationship with the Lord Jesus. It means to look after our bodies, prioritize your spiritual life, and say no to harmful lusts and sins that appeal to our flesh. Then we come to the next question, how do I love myself? Bad love takes the form of selfishness. Good love takes the form of stewardship. In short, the difference between the good and the bad love can be summed up with these two words, stewardship and selfishness. If you love yourself with agape, you will act as a steward of your life. Remember that we one day we will have to give account to our lives before the throne of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the table that follows will illustrate the difference. How do I love myself? On the one hand, selfishness is haughty. Stewardship is humble. Felt needs in comparison with real needs. And then passions in comparison with principles. 
self-satisfaction, on the other hand, self-discipline, and then greed, and then God. I want more of you, Lord Jesus. Bad self-love says that you must think the world of yourself, which leads to being proud. It teaches you to live by your felt needs. Do whatever you feel the need to do. After all, you deserve it. And this leads to a life of obeying our passions, following the urges of the sinful nature. And you are encouraged to practice self-satisfaction, to follow the desires of your heart, and do not deny yourself anything that your heart desires. And as a result, your life is ruled by greed, lust for money, power, and sex. When I prepared the Bible study, a passage came to mind which my grandmother taught me to read when I was, I think, 12 or 11 or 12 years of age. I didn't understand much of it at that stage, but I guess that's why I still remember the passage in Ecclesiastes. Towards the end of chapter 11 in Ecclesiastes, it says, You who are young, be happy while you are young, and let your heart give you joy in the days of your youth. Follow the ways of your heart, and whatever your eyes see, but know that for all these things, God will bring you into judgment. Now, godly love teaches you to live by God's commands. You are humble, not thinking too highly or too lowly of yourself. You put your real needs first, especially your spiritual needs. You live by God's principles, which means that you have to practice self-discipline and self-denial with respect to the things that are not best for you. Your life is submitted to the Lord Jesus Christ, who is your Lord and your King. Amen. Then slide number, next slide, how do I love myself? And the question they ask is, what comes first, love for self? Or love for others? Must I love myself so that I can love others? Or must I love others so that I can love myself? Now, it says there, joy. J for Jesus, O for others, U for yourself. And if you look at the top, God loves me. I love God. I love you. And I love me, which brings me back to God loves me. If we continue then to, to summarize what I have said this evening, I would like to use a passage in Second Peter chapter 1 from verse, I will show it to you on the screen. I first like to read two verses. 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. And I'm reading this from the Amplified Translation. For His divine power has bestowed upon us all things that are to life and godliness through the full personal knowledge of Him who called us by and to His own glory and excellence, virtue. By means of these, he has bestowed on us his precious and exceedingly great promises, so that through them, through the promises, that you may escape from the moral decay that is in the world because of covetousness and become sharers, partakers of the divine nature. Now, if you, if you have a look at the screen there, I have to admit to you that for many years I didn't have an idea why Paul mentioned all these things that, that's written in those verses and where it says that we've got to add to, I read to you from verse 5, where it says, For this reason, make every effort to supplement your faith 
with virtue, and then with virtue, with knowledge, and then with knowledge, self-control, and then self-control, steadfastness, and the steadfastness with godliness, and then godliness with brotherly love, and then brotherly love with love. For if these qualities are yours and increasing. So let's just go back. Now, in the Amplified Translation, that's where it opened up to me that I could understand it. Because there it says that for this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue. The Amplified Translation says by practicing your faith, you develop virtue. And by practicing virtue, you develop knowledge. And by practicing knowledge, you develop self-control. And by practicing self-control, you develop steadfastness. And the other one says perseverance or long-suffering. And by practicing steadfastness, you develop godliness. This is a process. And by practicing godliness, you develop brotherly affection. And eventually we come to philia. And by practicing philia, brotherly affection, we develop love, agape, godly love. Then the scripture says, if for if these qualities, which qualities, this process that we've just had a look at, if these qualities are yours and they, the Bible says they've got to increase, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. We come back to the knowledge. If we only want the knowledge, to know the scriptures, to know everything about the baptism and about the, the rapture and whatever. And we do not have the love of God and this process isn't present in us, then we will be ineffective in, and unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then verse 9, For whosoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he's blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. So, dear brothers and sisters, we have established that the agape is God's love, that it is unselfish love, that it is godly love, and that we should strive towards it, that we are in this process and by cooperating with the Holy Spirit inside of us, the Lord Jesus will bring this to the fore. That as these, this process that I've mentioned, which starts with faith in God, by practicing it, we develop virtue and we develop all these things along the way to finally to come forth with agape love, with God's love. And this is the, the Bible study for this evening. And it is my prayer that what I have learned from this, I told my wife Delia, I said to her this morning, when we came to the faith home almost 50 years ago, then you only think of, of talents, you think of gifts. I want this gift. What should it be like to have that gift? But the older you grow and the more mature you become, the more you realize that love is the supreme ethic that we should strive for, that the love of God that has been poured out in our hearts through the Holy Spirit should be worked out by obeying the Lord Jesus and by doing what he asked us to do. May the Lord be gracious unto you and to me and to help us therein. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, it is with, with gratitude that we come to you 
at the end of this Bible lecture and in preparing this Bible presentation, Lord, you spoke to me in my heart. And I realized so many things. I saw so many selfishness inside of me, wanting my own interest, Lord, in so many ways that tonight as we kneel before you, Father, uh, in humility, and we want to thank you that you brought this mirror of God's word in front of us, and we've got no one else to blame, Lord. We can just acknowledge our selfishness, and then we can give our hearts to you and, and to ask you, Father God, will you please help us to do what you've asked us to do? And dear Holy Spirit, will you please Put it in our hearts, Lord, to cooperate with you in this process that we are in in this world and we are moving towards the end. We are expecting you, Father God. We're expecting our Lord Jesus Christ to return and therefore we ask you, please have your way with us. Please accomplish your godly purpose in us. You have called us, Lord, your word says, to become, Lord, to the, to the image of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we also pray this evening for, for the president of this country. Your word says we must pray for the authorities in high places, and we pray for him, Father, and we pray for the government. We pray for the people of South Africa that are suffering, Lord. There are so many people that do not have enough food. And Father God, we still have food. And, and we just come before your throne and we ask you, Lord, will you please provide for them? In Jesus' name, amen. Dear ones, we wish you a good night's rest with the Lord's blessing on your household and on your family until we speak again. Lord bless you. Amen.